Our preschool through sixth grade students are dismissed for their Sunday school class. If you brought your Bible, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 11 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. If you uh, have downloaded the Sierra Bible Church app, you'll find the sermon notes in the app under the sermon notes tab, and you can follow along and fill in the blanks for Jesus uh, throughout the message. Uh, if you've been tracking along with us with the, these messages in Ephesians, or if, and if you've also kind of gone behind the scenes in our understanding of the book of Ephesians through either asking us questions to be answered on the podcast or just listening to the podcast, uh, you will know and you should know that Ephesians is one of the most beautifully written letters in the entire New Testament. It's like a theological Shakespearean sonnet in the way that uh, Paul unpacks the grace of God. It's so strikingly clear in his terms that the verbal image of the gospel is tattooed on his readers' lives spiritually as you're receiving this letter. And he began the letter kind of like this grace-addicted fanboy who has received God's grace and says, Praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in one long-winded sentence from verse 3 all the way to verse 14, just overflows with praise for the God who has saved him. Then he transitions into uh, praying specifically for the listeners and the readers of the, the letter to this church in Ephesus. He prays specifically, starting in verse 15 and going through verse 22, that their, uh, the eyes of their hearts would be opened to who Jesus Christ really is, and that in their lives they would unlock the spiritual power that is theirs in Christ. Then in chapter 2, start, starting uh, chapter 2, he begins with this very dark description of what life is like outside of Christ, apart from Christ, following our lusts and our passions, creating idols uh, to go after with our lives before we receive the grace of God in Christ. But God, he didn't leave us there. He, by his sheer grace, because of the great love with which he has loved us, rescued us, brought us into his kingdom, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. But this grace that God gives isn't just so that we might be saved and go to heaven one day eventually, although it is true that, that, that we will be in heaven because of God's grace and because of faith in God's grace and the person of Christ. But that grace right now is for the purpose of good works, as Pastor Cassidy preached last Sunday in chapter 2, verse 10. Now, in verse 11, Paul transitions into something that is so close to the heart of God that he literally bled for it. Something that is so important that he wants to make sure he clarifies, this is what my children who are saved by grace through faith, this is what they should be about. Now, when I say the word Republican, what comes to mind? If you're probably more conservative in your political ideology, you might have favorable association with that word. Perhaps a smile comes to your face when you hear the word Republican. You say, hmm, that's great. If you're more progressive or liberal politically, the word, you might scowl at the word Republican. And likewise, when I say the word Democrat, it might be equal and opposite feelings might be triggered in your mind. These words, they're so politically charged in our day and age that our minds instantly make judgments. And they gravitate, we gravitate toward people 
who support kind of our initial impulses about these charged words. It's like we are hardwired as a human race to tribalize, to join with like-minded people who support our way of viewing the world. From Cain and Abel all the way through the Protestant Reformation, the, the human race, we lean toward division as a result of living in a fallen world. And starting in verse 11, the Apostle Paul begins to describe a gospel reality that should categorize all of the people of God in, at all times. And it's this, church unity. Brothers and sisters, I want this so badly for our church. Not simply because I'm the pastor and it makes my life easier if you guys are unified, <laughs> but because this is so close to the heart of God. Jesus himself wants his body not only to be spiritually healthy and vibrant, he wants his body to be united under him, under his headship, under his authority. So in order for this spiritual reality to define us, we're going to let chapters 2, verses 11 through 22, sink deeply into our psyche, into our spirits. And today, the Apostle Paul just wants to remind Christians in Ephesus that, that outside of Christ, th there's no unity between Jews and Gentiles. If a person was born into a Gentile family before Christ, they're cut off from being a member of the children of God underneath the Old Covenant. And in outlining this, we, most of us, probably as Gentile Christians living in the 21st century, we're called to remember two things about our identity that help us to live in unity with one another as a church. So if, I brought your, if you brought your Bibles, uh, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. In chapter 2, we're just going to read verses 11 and 12 this morning. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I just pray that at this time, your spirit would be active and working inside of Sierra Bible Church, praying that your spirit would call us to unity, call us to fellowship, and not fluffy unity that is surface level and just gives a nice little handshake to other people who attend the same worship service from 9.30 till whenever the preacher stops. But God, I pray that you would give us real unity, substantive spiritual unity, a likeness of mind, likeness of spirit, likeness of vision, likeness of direction. God, and I pray that we as a church would be marked as a unified, as your unified body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now call to your mind the answer to this question. Do not say it out loud, especially if they are sitting next to you. <laughs> Who is the most difficult person in your life to get along with? Now when I ask this question, I'm not saying people that you can avoid because of the structures and the patterns of your life. It's people that you don't need to interact with either on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. I'm not talking about those people. Those are the ones you can avoid. I'm talking about the people that are hard to get along with, but you, by either your family, your job, or your neighborhood, you are forced to interact with them. Who is the hardest person in your life to get along with? 
And if you say no one, you're lying. <laughs> Who is the hardest person in your life to get along with? Everyone can think of that person. Well, in the first century, the Gentiles were those people to the Jews, and the Jews were those people to the Gentiles. The difficulty of working together as Jews and Gentiles was centuries old by the time the New Testament church was given birth. The Gentiles had ruled over the holy lands of Israel in the first century through the Roman Empire. The Jews were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire and they established their own patterns of religious identity and behavior that was often at odds with the Gentile culture at large. The Jews and Gentiles, while they were forced to live in the same cities, like in Ephesus or Philippi, even though there's only a few of them in Philippi, or Corinth or Thessalonica, they lived entirely, in the meaningful way, entirely separate lives. In fact, the Jews separated themselves voluntarily from the Gentiles in obedience to their God's word. Nothing symbolized this obedience to God's word more than the act of circumcision. Their forefather of the faith, Abraham, received a covenant from God which was ratified through circumcision in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10, all the way through 14. But it says this, God says this to the Jews, to, to Abraham. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Skipping forward to the verse 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The act of circumcision underneath the old covenant, the Jews were declaring to the world, we are God's people. We're sons of Abraham, the man of faith who received the covenant from God. Our circumcision sets us apart as Jews from the Gentiles. If any man wants to become a man of faith in our God, the God of Abraham, they must become circumcised and they must live under the authority of the law of our God. This created such a sharp division between Jew and Gentile. If a Gentile claimed that he was a Jew, there was a distinguishable mark to hold him accountable. Oh, you really want to be a Jew? Well, you need to go varsity then, buddy. In the first century, there was a lot of men and women, but men who were specifically attracted to the Jewish religion because of its structure, because of its morality, because of its wisdom. They were often, however, turned away after a couple of months at the synagogue and just seeing and hearing Torah. They were turned away from the faith because they were unwilling to take that final step to become circumcised. This was the story most likely of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, a man who the scripture says feared God. He respected the Jewish religion, but most scholars believe he wasn't circumcised as a Roman centurion. Because the church in Ephesus was deeply embedded in Gentile territory, and because we know from Acts chapter 19 that Gentiles in particularly in that particular city were receptive most to the gospel during Paul's time in the city, Paul begins his message about church unity addressing the Gentiles' natural identity before Christ came. He says to them, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Their heritage as Gentiles was a natural barrier to the people of God accepting them. There was no unity between Jew and Gentile because the Gentiles refused to accept circumcision. 
their natural birth precluded them from full participation in the people of God. And God, under the old covenant, God designed it this way. He enacted circumcision to be the sign of the people of God who would voluntarily submit themselves to the full counsel of God. And the Gentiles' unwillingness to receive this mark was a signal that they weren't unified with the people of God. But Paul even makes sure in this passage to let them know that circumcision itself has no saving power and it never has had saving power power. He concludes verse 11 by saying, the circumcision which is made in the flesh by the hands. One scholar comments, but perhaps the most critical comment of all is that circumcision was made with hands, an expression which drives home the point that it was merely human and stood in contrast to the work of God. In a way, at this particular comment, Paul is calling out the spiritual pride of the Jews, stating that, you know what, circumcision, that's only a sign. It has no saving power in and of itself. He is subtly pointing out, even to the Jews, under the old covenant, they still weren't saved by their works. They weren't saved by the act of circumcision itself. They were saved by God's grace to Abraham and every subsequent generation who had the faith in God's grace that was given to Abraham that would ultimately be seen through Abraham's seed, the promised Messiah. Under the old covenant, the, the sign of that grace coming into a person's life and exercising faith in Abraham's God was receiving the sign of his promise through circumcision to live underneath Torah or underneath the law. When you think of the American dream, what do you think of? When I say the words, the American dream, what comes to mind? Don't answer out loud. Perhaps baseball, the 4th of July, apple pie. But let me submit to you that probably one of the most dominant symbols of achieving the American dream is the white picket fence. The white picket fence communicates to the world that you've realized the American dream because you've earned enough to own your own home. It shows you have a yard in which the yard is fenced off with your particular property. It reveals you have a, a yard that's large enough to fit your 2.4 kids and your dog to run around in the yard. It reveals the barrier between the street and your yard so your kids don't run uncontrolled into the street. The picket nature of the fence, the fact that the, the pickets are spaced apart is kind of inviting to, welcome, to, uh, to other people. They can see through it. They can see, oh, that's what's going on inside of your yard. But it's a barrier to the world that ultimately says, this is my family's property. And it isn't owned by anyone else except for me and my family. Before the arrival of Christ, circumcision was the, the white picket fence of the Jewish people. If someone didn't enter the Jewish faith through the gate of circumcision and agree to live under the house rules of Torah, they weren't a member of the family of God. If you are a Gentile, meaning your direct descendants aren't from the 12 tribes of Abraham, and you're in this church today, under the old covenant, you would be cut off if you weren't a circumcised follower of the God of Abraham. To tell a Jew in the first century that they could share their property, their spiritual property, without coming through the gate of circumcision would have been absurd. It would have caused this visceral, instantaneous response of disgust. What? They're going to come in to our property and not even use the gate? Uh-uh. What? Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles are going to receive our promise as our people from our God? <laughs> oh no, not on my watch. 
Paul is reminding Gentile Christians in this passage of the way things used to be socially. They used to be cut off spiritually from God. The neighbors whom they lived among, the Jews, they could see into their spiritual property. They could see that they were different, but they were never allowed to enter in to their private property without entering through the gate of circumcision. But now, at the coming of Christ, these two radically different social groups are now forced into the same church to live in harmony under the authority of the Lord Jesus in the same spiritual property. Now, let me drive this point home for us. Can you think of people in our church that you allow to enter into your spiritual and relational property. What I mean by that is getting to know them and live in harmony with them. Not just a handshake during the welcome time here on a Sunday morning, but actually get to know and allow into your life solely because you are a Christian. <laughs> solely, not because you share the same workplace, not because you vote for the same political party, not for any other reason other than I am a Christian and this other person is a Christian, we have a bond in Christ that, that compels us to live unified with one another. Since I was about 20 years old, the most meaningful relationships that I have developed have been solely because I'm a Christian. I love you guys, but if it wasn't for the grace of God at work in my life, I would not be up here compelling you guys to do this. It is God's grace that is at work in different types of people that causes us to join together with people who are much different than us, socially speaking, under the authority of Jesus and live in harmony with one another. So can you think of friends that you have made solely because you are a Christian? I hope so. I hope so. There should be people in your life and you should allow people into your life solely because of the spiritual bond that you have in Christ. And this is why Paul goes even to the next level of reminding the Gentiles of their devoid spiritual heritage. He makes the distinction so stark that no division between any group in the, in the church currently could ever match. He tells the Gentiles, remember that being a Gentile separated you from Christ. Christ came through the Jews. He was the promised Messiah of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. The Jewish heritage is the one that foresaw the coming of Christ, and it was through the Jews that God promised to bring about his Messiah. It was Abraham's seed that would be the blessing to the nations. He also mentions that outside of Israel, the, the Gentiles were cut off, were cut off from Christ. He goes further in saying that they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The term alienated here that Paul uses is another use, uh, he uses this term also in Colossians twice and once here, in, or twice in Ephesians and once in Colossians. And every term that is used, when he uses this term alienation, is talking about the state of, uh, before one is reconciled to God. God vertically restores our sinful state back to, back to him, but he also causes us to be in a reconciled relationship with his people once we are saved. But before that happens, remember, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel But they weren't only alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, they were also strangers to the covenants of promise. Uh, one scholar says, the Gentiles' exclusion from the community of God's people meant that they had no share in the covenants of promise of messianic salvation. The covenant to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and David, they were cut off from those promises just in their Gentile state. And the tragic climax of the Gentile state is concluded in verse 12. Having no hope and without God in the world. 
My in-laws work very closely with a college ministry on the campus of Bradley University in central Illinois. And there's a, a number of international students that, uh, that do graduate level, graduate level work at Bradley University. And they bring in students from all over the world. Well, their college ministry has, it was engaged in outreach to these international students. And one student was training to be an, an Islamic imam. Uh, he was training deeply and deeply embedded in the Islamic worldview from Saudi Arabia in a high-ranking family. While he's at Bradley University, God just gets a hold of his life. He, uh, I don't want to go into too many details about it, but he has completely left everything for the sake and for the call of Christ. When he tells when he tells his stories of interactions with Christians before he came to Christ, when he was entrenched in Islam, he would, he'd say, he would say this, I would literally get mad at Christians when they talked about the hope that they had of, becoming, of being in heaven. Under the Islamic worldview, there's no assurance that you're going to be in heaven. If you die, perhaps Allah might grant you mercy, but he might not. But there's no assurance this side of heaven that you are going to be in heaven with God. And he would say, and he would say that he would get so bothered when Christians would talk in such flippant terms about how their rock solid hope of being in heaven one day. Well, this is the state of all Gentiles before the coming of Christ, whether they're from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Scandinavia, or even Sparks. Every person before coming to Christ is outside of the sphere of God's eternal hope that he gives to us in Christ. It's only through God's gracious initiative in Christ that we are brought into his eternal spiritual property. And this eternal property that will one day be realized forever in heaven, the sign of that eternal reality is Jews and Gentiles, male and female, living together in harmony in God's church. You and me, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, Arab and Norwegian, black and white, Republican and Democrat, living under the authority of God. Every person who has been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ is forced to live together with one another in this new, dynamic, spiritual family called the church. <laughs> one of the indictments that I think God is going to bring swift and total judgment upon his church as it is realized and manifest today, is our lack of consideration for those who have different ethnic and religious backgrounds. It is way too common in our church circles, in the same city, in the same country, to have the wealthy church and the poor church. The black church, the white church, the middle class church, the old church, the hipster church, and the scholarly church. I think on the last day when Christ returns, many of our churches are going to be like a deer in headlights looking at Jesus as he calls us into account. It's like, what were you thinking? Don't you realize that you're all brothers and sisters now if they've placed their faith in me, Jesus Christ? You only had 80 years to get along. That's all I gave you. That's all you, I only gave you 80 years for you guys to get along with one another. And you couldn't even do that. You still tribalized into various different churches to reach a specific ethnic and religious background type of person. You systematically and intentionally created programs and structures to significantly alienate brothers and sisters whom I, Jesus Christ, bought with my own blood and paid for them. I don't care if they don't make as much money as you. I don't care if they listen to rap music. 
I don't care if they hate hymns. I don't care if they're on welfare. I don't care if they vote for a different political party. They are mine. I bought them. They're no longer cut off. They're members of my spiritual body, the church, the hands and feet, my hands and feet. Here, can't you guys just get along with one another? If God can call through the Apostle Paul Jews and Gentiles, probably the most polarized groups in perhaps the history of the world, to unite in his church, there isn't a Christian in Reno that we shouldn't be able to live united with here at Sierra Bible Church. One of the clearest demonstrations of this was at the small church that I was raised in. The, the community that I grew up in was in the far north suburbs of Chicago. There were many government-subsidized housing developments in our town, by the time my family moved, when I was in middle school, the community was over 50% Hispanic and, and African American. One Sunday at that church, I was probably about eight years old. I was probably about eight years old, and our choir director, his name was Harold, he paused the hymn singing, and he called Clarence to the platform. The choir director, Harold, he was a CPA. He was a finance guy, did not leave the house without a three-piece suit and a pocket protector and a calculator. <laughs> Clarence was an African-American public school dean of students. Clarence approached the plat platform. Harold put his arm around him. Clarence put his arm back around Harold. And Harold said to the whole congregation, I'd like to introduce you to my brother. Clarence. Living in a racially diverse community, my first memory of true unity, heart, soul, mind, spiritual unity, didn't come through a peace rally or a diversity training program or even a march for civil rights. My first impression that I had of what true unity looks like was Harold and Clarence. And it wasn't just tokenism. It wasn't just for show. I saw week after week how they loved one another, how they allowed for the kids to come over to each other's house, how they became genuine, real, substantive friends, how they both loved Jesus with their whole entire heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how they wanted their community that racially and ethnically and even economically diverse community. They wanted that community to know the love of Jesus, and they knew that the best way to do that was for them to love one another. They were friends, genuine, real, substantive, spiritual friends, and their kids were friends. And as a result, I became friends with them. So brothers and sisters, let me land this message here with two who appeals to us. First, the unity that God wants to bring about here at Sierra Bible Church, as we're currently composed, probably is not between ethnicities, although Reno is becoming a much more ethnically diverse city and a long-term goal, we need to be working toward that. But I think probably our Unity issue that we really need to press for, press toward in the short term is not unity among ethnicities, although that's on the long-term radar, but unity between ages and generations. Ooh, I, I actually got a couple of yeses and amens, like a couple of nods there. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not I'm on the right track here, I hope. When, when people ask me, who don't know anything about Sierra Bible Church, what, what type of people attend Sierra Bible Church, I just tell them the truth. It's people my parents' age and older and people my age and younger. And unless we take these next two messages to heart from Ephesians and take them seriously, we're going to be in trouble about that dynamic. So here's my first appeal. A social challenge. If you're younger than 40, 
get to know somebody older than 60. If you're younger, or if you're older than 60, get to know someone younger than 60. Oops, typo, 40. <laughs> get to know someone younger than 40. Now, some of you, like four or five of you, are like, wait, I'm 40s and 50s. <laughs> what about the 50s? 40s and 50s? Well, we're just glad you're here. Just, <laughs> just stay here. <laughs> we're just stay here. You laugh because it's true. <laughs> don't, 40s and 50s, don't leave. Stick around. Be the bridge that the older folks, to get, the, to, get to know some of the younger folks, and between these two growing di- demographics in our church. Uh, the second appeal, the second appeal, embrace social change. Now, I'm not saying theological change, I'm not saying doctrinal change, I'm not saying even philosophy of ministry change. I'm saying social change. The dynamics within our church, the social people who you are called to get along with and live together with in the church is changing. Embrace that. The structures and ministry initiatives that we're going to be building kind of in calendar year 2019 are going to be brand new. They're things that I have never seen any church try ever because we're unique (laughs) and we need it. They draw from our deep well of spiritual heritage that we have in the gospel, but they've never been done before. Now, I'm not trying to oversell this, but some of the things that we're going to be rolling out in calendar year 2019 are things that I've never seen any church attempt. And it's going to shake us up socially and force us to be more united as the people of God and more centered on the gospel. Now, if you want more details about that, you can send in your questions to iron at sierrabible.org, and we might answer them there. But brothers and sisters, all of this, all of this will fail if we tribalize under, uh, and, and take under the authority of Jesus, and we tribalize into various groups and lob grenades at the other side. Brothers and sisters, without Christ, everything, there is no unity. Without Christ, there is no uh, coming together underneath the authority of Jesus. And if the only way for us to experience true, real, lasting unity is to realize we can't do it in our own strength unless it's under the authority of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is what you want from us. You want us to be a diverse yet unified group of both old and young, church that is ministering to the needs of all of the people that you have called to be members of Sierra Bible Church. Help us, Heavenly Father, to not tribalize. Help us to look to you as our chief head, our leader, as the one who has called all of these different types of people to be members together of your body. Help us to walk closely with you, to get to know people who are different than us, and to be your people, your hands, your feet, here in Reno. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.